The time has come for us to cross the planet, raising innocent villages, fighting inferior armies, and doing your best to speed up the creation of The Hague. And to start with style, we begin our peregrination of terrible acts in the heart of the Persian Empire, Bukhara. And like a complete fucking idiot, I didn't press record until 15 minutes in, where we already had a set camp and the White Huns acting like the IRS, trying to get my money. But we pay, because we're not ready to deal with these nutsacks yet. Literally worse than the taxmen. But at this point we were already beating the raiding parties and advancing to Imperial Age, because at the Imperial nothing can stop the Persian might, where the Shah arrives with the chunky corp and the tributes roll in like Stephen Hawking at an astrophysics convention. But the full might of it is not complete, and we need heaps of stables, for many knights are needed to deal with the Huns. We also met the Sogdian folks across the river and buy them out because I'd never say no to having cataphracts in the roster, especially when you tell me they excel against cavalry archers. But it ain't all, we're Persians, and it would be stupid to not use the most beautiful unit of all time, the Savar. And while the army slowly becomes something useful, we push back at their petty aggression and raid at their Hun raiders. Oh, what a coincidence seeing you guys here. Oh god, there's more coming this way. Luckily we had a decent army ready and sent them over as backup. Feel the might of it, fuckers. I've just had enough of these little barbarian revolts and oh god, they're coming again. But haha, Sogdian surprise. And we virtually wipe out their stupid little army. We have a very good edge over them at the moment, so we push in. Oh yeah, another thing that happened that I didn't mention. The Gokturks offered to ally us against the Huns, so we naturally took the opportunity and now we're working on our side as a distraction while as usual we do all the work. Having their camp sodomized doesn't matter much to them and they continue to rush me with siege units and cavalry archers. Not that I'm complaining, makes my life easier. Now that we're finishing the speedruns I have to admit, I will not miss fighting against cavalry archers. Sadly we must also fight the Gokturks when they inevitably betray us, but it's fine because I have a plan. And while we set up said plan, time to torture the Huns a bit more. But what is the plan, you may ask? Siege engineer training. Similar to what NATO countries do, we send troops to allies to learn new things. Like sending onagers to learn better aim on the Gokturks villagers. Look at that, they even come around to watch the exercise. Meanwhile with the Huns, we brought elephants this time. Sadly they brought drilled up siege rams. But Huns don't have drill, Metsamias, how is that a thing? Well, there's a weird obscure explanation as to why White Huns are Mongols here. It's because they're actually Mongols. Anyways, we continue pushing in as deep as we can into their base, but as usual fighting against cavalry archers is as fun as dipping your balls in battery acid. It's not. Meanwhile up north, the onager training goes outstandingly and we have raised most of their camp. A small silver lining for losing our whole army. Now watch how much of a pain in the ass them being Mongol is. Not only they can have siege rams, they have drill, which makes them elusive, and as an AI personality, they come straight away to the town center. But we can't let ourselves be affected by their relentlessness, and for fuck's sake, it's every two minutes, how do they even make enough gold to sustain this? That's it, I'm declaring conscription to everyone against the Hun weapons of mass destruction. At least our military exercise with the Gokturk is still going well, and after repelling another unnecessary raid, we decide to get payback and torch all their farms and houses and honestly anything that isn't natural off the map. Carl, look at how the thing throws rocks by itself, isn't it incredible? The pesky hunts continue to catch me by surprise and we lose the main siege engines before we could save it, and out of sheer pettiness, we stay to raise what we can. The Gokturks continue trying to rebuild what we destroy, but I'm not giving up easily on the plan to defeat them before crap. They got wise to me. The Hunt's southern base gets wiped just in time for us to have another huge headache to deal with. The scenario just turned into a 2v1. We rush the remaining White Hunt camp to see how much damage can be inflicted before the situation gets worse, but it seems like time is not on our side and the Gokturks run straight past everything to the heart of our economy. The Savars gallop at top speed to catch up, but we still suffer some losses from our purple dickheads. Luckily we have weakened them a fair amount in the sneaky plan and oh for fuck's sake they rebuilt everything already. Guess pillaging is back on the menu. Oh god they're working together now. Doesn't matter, it'll make the victory screen taste even better than before. How the fuck did they rebuild so quickly everywhere? I'm not having fun anymore. Back at the Huns we find a secret weaker entrance towards their base and start leveling their military... I just wanna cry. I haven't been so frustrated in a scenario since Into China with Genghis Khan. Also considering how poorly everything is going, I might take longer here than I did there. It's like fighting a cockroach infestation, you kill one and 30 more show up. 
except here the cockroaches are on horses or pushing turbo-powered battering rams. Things are dire for everyone, the Huns and Gokturks have pretty much been reduced to nothing, while I have no way to produce units fast enough to deal with the constant raiding. So we are forced to switch to light cavalry to save gold, and rebuilding castles to see if we can stop the raids, because they keep pulling units out of their asses apparently. We find a Hun tree line, and I'm not gonna lie, murdering all of them here gave me a semi. The fighting continues everywhere on the map, with skirmishes happening in every corner, and the situation tightening more by the minute for the Persian Empire, with the Gokturks starting even their own siege ramp production. Hope seemed to be fading by the second for us. The few troops we had run at great speed to sabotage their production, ignoring obnoxious cavalry archers, doing everything within reach to end the hellish nightmare. Or at least make sure the raids aren't as awful to deal with. Our raiding party started achieving unexpected success, and we continued pushing deeper into their territory, looking for whatever villagers they had left. But on this marvelous run, we forgot to check back at base, and the Gokturks had pushed deep into our base. At this point, it was too late to go back, so we soldier on while the town center defended itself. With the Gokturks out of the way, we just had to finish decapitating the White Huns, and the army was called for the job with bloodshot eyes. Everyone that could still hold a sword was summoned to fight them, and as the new army arrives, we not only destroy everything, we take the rubble and throw into a furnace and erase every memory of them ever existing. Fucking finally. There's a bounty of 50 gold for every single White Hun pinky finger brought to me. Bukhara finally over, in 2 hours, 16 minutes and 52 seconds and we killed 1,132 units. Fuck everything about the scenario. This was awful in every possible way. Well, this sucked ass. But at least we get to fly to the new world now, filled with jungle and exotic fruits, and most of all, uncultured savages beating the shit out of each other in the Tikal area. And it all starts with them already beating the living shit out of each other. But we have nothing to do with that, for Dos Pilas is neutral and my homeboy Evan gave me yet another tip on what to do with this. We arrive at the city and the population doesn't seem to be interested in the cartel wars between Tikal and Kalakmu. According to Sultan Evan, the best option here is actually the historically accurate. So while Kalakmu sends his thugs to poke the walls, very suicidally might I add, we casually walk in the mighty city of Tikal with our starting forces, completely unbothered by the apparently dormant defenses and population. Switch sides in the diplomacy tab from brother in taco to enemy of tequila, and to much desperation of the civilians, start tearing down the pyramid, brick by brick. Oh no, they're destroying the pyramid! Quick, let's throw a rave! Meanwhile, back at the base, life continues the same, with villagers doing their work and Kalakmu train bodies at the walls. Since we only sent a small force, the destruction of the wonder takes a long ass time, but at least we're entertained by the raving. For some reason, Kalakmu, who is at war against the cow, comes to help defend against us. Why are you doing this? We're on your side. The wonder finally falls, but we stick around to roleplay as Mexican and skin their civilian population alive for the gods. Now we just need to reach Castle Age, and once Kalakmu sends more troops to Dos Pilas and the soldiers warn at the complete loss of hope, we meticulously delete the city's defenses and send all the villagers out of the city so our overlords can move in. Theoretically we should move to another village, but since Kalakmu offered suzerainty to us, we graciously accept by touching their wonder, and Tikal is defeated, as the only condition was their wonder being destroyed. Dos Pilas ends with sneaky tactics, the juiciest of ways, and a nice time of 18 minutes and 5 seconds. This was much better, and we even caused the collapse of a mighty city, how great is that? But now we must lower the quality once again and become French, because the Umayyads are at Tour's doorstep. At least we're embodying one of the greatest Frenchmen of all time, Charles Martel. And yes, I am aware that he was Belgium, not French, but I'd rather have him as a baguette-eating frog than a literal spoil of the devil. Anyways, we sent Charles and his gang towards Tours while using the city's resources to establish an economy to fight heretics from the Umayyad Caliphate. Luckily, the Umayyads are jealous desert folk and would rather destroy what they can't have instead of attacking the city. Look at all these sheep I'm gonna kill separately. Holy shit, no wonder the Berbers feared him, his throwing arm is like an AR-15. Because I gave up on moderate difficulty after Bukhara, we ignored the petty Umayyad bullying and marched towards their camp to retrieve the baggage train. Exactly, Mr. X-Men. If we bring all 6 cards, the scenario is over, which should speed up our times by a redonkulous amount. We just have to walk in- God damn it, this fucking pathing sometimes. It's fine, we just have to wait until someone else walks out, and once someone does, a knight of the Chainsmoker Acrobat's table is sent to sneak in towards the cards. Step 1 complete without hiccups, now we just need to get them back in one piece. No! Oh my god! Oh! 
You absolute mongoloid. Why did you trigger the AI? The murder of the cards doesn't mean defeat, but I want the sneaky tactics to work, and we restart the scenario. We're back again at the corner of the map, and this time we go straight for the Berber camp down south. Little fun fact, Tarek's campaign should have ended here, but the Caliph told him to control his bloodthirsty and go back. Probably why the Umayyads got beaten by the French. Anyway, a nice scorpion holds the gates and the knights run in to hold it open. As one of them rushes in to capture the cards, I remember to put them in defensive mode to avoid the little mishap from before, and the card starts moving towards the open gates. But for some godforsaken reason, I feel like it's a good idea to attack the town center, triggering the 8th century equivalent of NATO's Article 5 response, and half the camels in Europe show up to fight us. In a fit of panic, I forget to switch the attack stance, and Charles is the first to bite the dust. With the army in shambles, the gates close, alongside our chance to sneak the carts out of the city of Poitiers. Not a problem though, we try again to refine the tactics once more. Charles Martel's Great Heretic Adventure Take 3, the final Hon Hon. I always thought this to be one of the best design scenarios in the game. Tours and its surroundings really feel like a feudal city. With the army split in two, we lure the camels outside, allowing us to witness a cool battle between scimitar throwers and axe throwers. And even though we messed up keeping the gate open, a sweet scorpion comes to our rescue. Now for the actually tough part. Cart secured right under their noses and on their way out of the city. The Umayyad backup arrives just as we're leaving the city and a huge slap fight begins outside city walls. A perfect opportunity for the cars to sneak by while the French army gets annihilated by Moorish forces. At this point I'm so tense you could fashion violin strings out of my muscles. But even though I get a bit lost in the map, due to not preparing at all for this or even checking the map before starting, the carts parade themselves through the Frankish countryside unbothered until we reach the suburbs of Tours, where the population celebrates ecstatically with a lot of wine, croissants and cigarettes one of the most important victories in their history, ending the scenario in a very sweet 9 minutes and 57 seconds. That felt dirty, but what we're about to do in England is worse. Valhalla calls, and he calls for the colonization of the barbaric sewage water drinkers. I hope you didn't get used to the fast times, because York is a proper slogfest. We start with Mr. Jarl here barking orders, and even though I don't like being told what to do, he has a point. We sail north to find a place to settle. We decide to set camp in the edge of the highlands, because I'm a visionary, and I know good whiskey comes from around here. Skull to you as well, good sir. And we fast forward a bit as the timer imposed on us is nothing but a symbolic treaty by the game to allow us to grow a bit before the pillaging begins. Hark hark, let's see what our buddies from Norway sent us. 40 elite drakars primed and ready to loot, pillage and plunder everything that speaks English. Oh, we are gonna have some proper viking fun today. The game gives us a choice between four objectives to end the scenario build a wonder in York, capturing 15 relics, stockpiling 50,000 gold, or defeating 5 enemies. This is a big reason why York is one of my favorite historical battles. There's a lot of freedom on how to win, but today we'll be taking the route of the shackles and lining your new distillery town with the gold of the British Isles. If it is the quickest route, I'm not sure, but it's definitely the easiest one, as the navy sent from Norway is incredibly overpowered at this stage of the game, and most of the British Isles are set on the coast and in navigable rivers. The enemies do have fortifications around their cities, but the Drakars are so strong it barely tickles us, and once we hit Imperial Age, this is only gonna get worse for them. Right now we are limited in range and damage, and even though we can still reach most of the pillageable buildings, it will be nice to be extra safe and outrange their towers with the blacksmith technologies. Because I know the Brits come to bother us, we build a dock and order some more longships using the finest Scottish lumber we can find. Upon arriving in the Irish coast, we find some shit on fire, because it's not just us tormenting the natives, the British kingdoms are also at constant fight with each other. Sadly, that was the only time I managed to capture them fighting each other, but it would have been cool to stumble upon an army descending hell upon Luton or another English shithole. If you think it's weird how laggy the game is, just check out the size of the map. That's another reason why I like this scenario, it's absolutely massive. The devs put a lot of effort into making the island feel big and populated, Plus there's multiple enemies, and they all have their respective strengths and weaknesses, all while being either Celt or Briton, which I think is pretty cool. Also some cities have massive cathedrals to be looted, giving us 6000 gold a pop. Thanks Christianity, your gold helps our cause a great amount, and your monks are great target practice. Look at this one turning into Swiss cheese, haha, <laughs> die molester. They have virtually no way to defend themselves, and we reach 30% of the goal with 36 drukars still standing. But as mighty as the navy is, it won't be enough to fulfill the goal, and we use the spoils of war to fully upgrade the army being raised back at camp. Oh wow, that's a beautiful cathedral you have there. But its debris is now a property of Moose Dunk Incorporated. 
If they ever decide to nerf the longships, the easiest way will probably be making them have an actual hitbox, because this just looks absurd, no one can fight them in tight spaces. We can just sail in tiny rivers, while the Britons send one galley at a time to their deaths. Another monastery, another dollar. I know it's the smartest thing to do, settling next to water, but it leaves so unprotected against brutal genocidal invaders coming to steal their lands and do blood eagles with their elder population. For those who don't know, a blood eagle is when a person has their hands tied with ropes and pulled apart like a human tug of war until the ribcage opens like a blossoming flower. Which is exactly what I'll do to green if they don't stop sending their stupid army to attack my castle. The army arrives in what would be Newcastle, and I would say B Newcastle because I had beef with these people. When I lived in London, I got punched twice by someone from there because he thought I was hitting on his girlfriend. Oh wow, he mistook me for another dark-haired bearded guy that looked like a young Bin Laden. So fuck him, and fuck Newcastle. Let's level this dump. Down south, we continue sniping unsuspecting monasteries while simultaneously commanding the army around the countryside of England. I'm so good at micro. And would you look at that, over half the objective done. Yeah, it's taken me over an hour to do this. But playing as Viking is a guilty pleasure of mine, so I'm just not here for a good time. I'm here for a good time. I think if they wanted to make this a bit more challenging, the navy has to be nerfed. I still have 25 of the original 40 ships, and it's not like I've been careful or anything. Her her, you're playing on standard, you can't complain when you're playing on standard. Well, the challenge for this scenario is winning without the navy and on hard. So give me some weeks, and I'll ascend to an enlightened enough level to join the conversation. Anyways, because we're running out of coastal monasteries to raid, we move our fresh army towards York, because it would be stupid to play York without actually scarring the city deeply with our atrocities. We load up the APCs with our rabid warriors and enter the line of fire of the city's defenses. I've made a video about this scenario before and I was dumbstruck by the amount of castles here, and to no surprise, I was dumbstruck again by 6 castles and a fortress. But no castle can hold back the power of the berserkers and steel-clad siege rams, and the wish version of the Rock of Cashel falls. Look at this shit, is everyone here living in a castle? Anyways, at this point I got bored and started selling the almost infinite resources I had, as I was reaching the final percents of the 50,000 gold. Sadly, I'm as good trading in the game as I am in real life, and fall 2,000 gold short. Now I was not only short on the final amount, but completely empty of any chance to rebuild a pillaging force. But my IQ is of a room temperature glass of water, not entirely zero, so we sent some villagers to the unexplored north in hopes of finding some more shackles. The expedition is a success, and our brave miners start stripping the shiny rocks off the ground. In a sad attempt to cut corners, the last remaining troops are sent to scout around for more unprotected villages to loot, but all we find is a heavy rain of arrows before the miners finish filling the vault of Odin. Praise be the Azir, and his now gold-plated Shlong, and also praise be the end of the scenario. I like it, but when you're trying to play all 16 scenarios it becomes a lot. 1 hour, 38 minutes and 5 seconds is the final time. God damn, it's always fun to perform shenanigans with Drakars. But maybe we spice things up with the opposite of that. Perhaps helping Hungary settle into a new country? Yeah, it'll be good to do some good for a change. Ugh, creepy. This loading screen is so unsettling. Like I was saying, it'll be good to be the good guys for once. We start with a very primitive camp, but a surprisingly good army to go along with. And we march to beat some sense on the Avars. Yeah, they were here before, but we need space to turn this into the mighty Magyar Empire. Good thing we're not in a hurry. After clearing the tower, we rush in to tell the citizens of our new development plan for the region. But they are not very receptive of the idea, and we are forced to re-educate the city. Check out this micro, Ah, We thought the tower took long to destroy, but the town center was at another level. No, don't run, get back here, we're starting the Hungarian lesson soon. The town center is converted and the re-education goes splendidly, with three villagers becoming Hungarian. We continue pushing deep into Avar territory, clearing any military resistance we can find on the way, and you may think it's unnecessary considering the year is 897 and the world population is around 200 million, so there's plenty of space around here. Well, by defeating the Avars, we are awarded with Castle Age, instantly and for free. Plus a wise lesson to be learned about being a little bitch. I know I said we were supposed to be the good guys, but we can be good guys while also making sure our people thrive and prosper. Anyways, let's start Moravia now. Ha, ah, get off my land, wench. We run straight into the Moravian main camp and begin the struggle against the town center while we prepare to deal with their castles scattered around the desired lands. Their town center falls and from the ashes emerge two converted villagers whom we send straight away to the quarries, for they must prove themselves if they want the passport. Up north we find more unsuspecting villagers wearing the wrong street colors and we throw them a party to welcome them into the neighborhood. At this point, our new siege weapons had arrived at the first castle, and shortly after, it came tumbling down. 
another town center is found, but our luck started turning when they ambushed the ramps and destroyed them. The resource generation was also abysmally smaller than we hoped for, but the Byzantines arrived with a very generous offer. Heaps of sweet Roman gold if we joined them on the war against the Bulgars. A tempting offer, but dealing with the Moravian threat was a bigger priority, and with a better organized army we raised our towns in record speed. Also that pesky castle that wiped our first wave of rams. And as soon as their final center bites the dirt, Moravia packs their bags and throws in the towel. With the north secured, it was time to start building our new home, and prepare for war against the Bulgarians. Being an Imperial and being able to sleep in an actual bed triggered the Bulgarians, and they came for our camp with anger in their hearts. In panic I built a market, like literally right next to the one I started with. I'll give you a minute to laugh. The Bulgarians end up massacring our whole army, all while East Francia's forces decided to raid our brand new town center. But we're not dead yet, and with a new force of cavalry, the Bulgarians are repelled out of our lands. I'm not even gonna delete one of them, this will be a fun detail in history for the future. We march towards Bulgaria and swiftly pulverize whatever useful building they have standing. They are much more advanced than Moravia and hide their fortifications behind walls, an idea we'll save for the future. Fortunately, we came prepared and the castle fuels the pound of the rams until it also turns to dust. We continue searching for our sweet triumph, but end up facing the worst enemies of all time, the Konigs. Our cavalry is massacred and the rams forced to retreat. A new battalion is sent to reinforce and another slap fight starts on the riverbed this time resulting in a Magyar victory. The army stayed and made sure the northern Bulgarians would have to at least rebuild from scratch. Up further north, more fortifications appeared in the fog and the army got to work, while back in our lands more defenses were being built at all times. Our siege engines were destroyed during the siege and the few troops remaining forced to retreat. But it's fine and dandy as another massive army was already on the way. First a cavalry running in to clear the resistance and whatever bullshit inside walls that was easy to break. And as the siege arrives, the Krapos becomes the target, resulting in more land freed for Hungary. More troops arrive, and we continue marching towards the heart of Bulgaria. The Bulgarians don't approve of me showing up and send everyone to try and stop me, completely decimating the entire army we brought here. Not a problem, there's another one here. We march again towards the green bullshit, and this time they barely tickle our horsemen and start knocking on their door. Someone answered, and we can walk in without breaking down the gates, and breaking the Krapost instead. With their camp leveled, Bulgaria resigns, opening Europe for plunder. And settling for the Hungarians also, we can't forget the good deeds. And a very unique scenario ends, in 1 hour, 35 minutes and 2 seconds. It feels great to help out those who have weird languages, even if they drink that god-awful palinka. But there's still a lingering thirst for plunder in the new world, so why not combine both? Norway just doesn't have the same vibe as you used to, you know what I mean? Not only the wolves in winter, but also those cocksuckers from Sweden acting up. And we're good people, we don't want to fight against the Surströming Caliphate. After all, they are our Nordic brothers. So listen up everybody, we're moving past the land of ice and snow, so let's prepare as much as we can. Go to Feudal Age and start planning how to cross the fiery serpent sea of bolt annihilation. Before leaving, we sail south to plunder the Britons a bit, since we haven't found Norway's oil yet, and there's no gold here. Like I mentioned before, the sea is lava, so we must cross through Greenland to reach the new world. So we load up the ships and go on holidays in Scotland, so we can have our exodus to Canada a bit more relaxed, and with a higher morale amongst the ranks. This may have been a bad idea. Our army gets decimated by a tower and some archers, and we go back to Norway a bit frustrated. Not like that would stop us, we bring some villagers to start production right in their faces. Let's see them try something funny against, well, more spearmen than last time? Back in Norway, we load up more ships and set sail towards Greenland, where we can set up a pit stop on our way to Canada. We start with a stable and barracks to replenish the troops and torch the Eskimos buildings. In Scotland, our much stronger second army comes down on them and the evil tower is finally destroyed, and the pillaging is enough to send us to the castle age. With the gold supply restocked, it's time for Eric the Red to start making way towards the new world. But since we're in Castle Age, a proper bastion of Viking strength is erected in Greenland, so we can train more berserkers. The wolf disagrees with our idea of having blacksmiths, and supposedly the people back in Norway are in trouble. But who cares, we're moving to Canada anyways. While exploring, we meet a most unusual new friend, Pingu, the war criminal penguin. This is a great scenario, but the historical inaccuracy, like Greenland having an university or the idea of them knowing how to read is just ridiculous. Our army walks around looking for the easiest way to reach the western coast, and while the natives try their best to stop us, we walk pretty much unbothered by their presence until we reach the other side of the island. 
The second objective begins, sending the rest of the army and the villagers around Greenland, making sure neither Eric or the villager die to the inbred savages that live around here. With everyone safe and sound, we begin construction of a dock and transport ships. Is this thing of the army rearranging themselves when you split it new? I don't remember seeing this before. With the ships hitting water, we embark everyone possible and set sail away from the land of just ice called Greenland. Am I picking too much on Greenland? Meh, what are they gonna do? Send all five people that live there to protest me? Come on, Pingu, we're not leaving you here. With our whole force with boots on the ground, we immediately order a castle to protect against the other savages, because we must properly colonize the area. A town center, market and 12 houses are needed to start new Oslo. Of course they're not gonna like our presence, but we're Vikings. They aren't the first and they won't be the last. We take the lead and catch them by surprise, but I send Eric back to the camp, because if he dies, we lose. The town center is ordered while the army annihilates the Skrellings in the name of Odin. The battle is brutal, and we end up losing to their outrageous number of soldiers. But that should buy us enough time to settle properly in the region. With more villagers showing up, the camp starts growing, and shortly after, our cozy little village becomes a town, and the scenario is over, in 1 hour, 4 minutes and 29 seconds. Enough Europe for now. We have neglected the Middle East since Bukhara, and you know what a flaming dumpster fire that place is. This time it's the Byzantines' fault, and we incarnate the Turks to deal with that. We all know Anatolia is modern Turkey, but in 1071 it wasn't yet, and this is what we're here to do. Fight the Byzantines and start the Turkification of the region. The scenario has as the main objective defeating the Byzantines, for which we'll need heaps of camels for, and as strong as we can make them. There's also the secondary objectives of subduing the neighboring cities of the region, Cappadocia, Pisidia and Galatia. But that's just honestly a waste of time, so we'll ignore the cliff people and just follow the narrow path north, for I have two trebuchets and the benefits of liberating the cities are not worth the hassle of dealing with the endless gates and Byzantine raids. As we approach Byzantine structures, the trebs start working. They're not a big fan of our engineering miracles, and a bitch slap starts, and ends shortly after, in our favor. Onto the castle outside their walls. One of our cavalry archers come to us with some bitch-ass statements about being patient. Is anyone else having ideas about safe place? No? Good. More of the army arrives to reinforce the kebab riders and we slowly push their walls. I wish at some point they add an actual siege scenario in the game, where you have to starve out the city and use actual tactics to breach their defenses, because right now I feel it has gotten quite stale. The moment you have traps, the enemy just doesn't have that much they can do. I mean, they can try sending rams, but how often do the rams actually arrive in one piece? All defenses have been broken and dealt with, and the fun of the scenario actually starts. Someone called the Dutch, because I'd like to buy a one-way trip to the ICC. What are you guys doing here? You're missing out on all the fun! I don't know the name of the city, but if it depends on me, it doesn't matter, because we're erasing it from history. You don't have to destroy everything at Simias. Well, I don't know what triggers them to resign, so better safe than sorry. Now the Turks have a place to call home, atop thousands of Byzantine schools, and 18 minutes and 5 seconds. Ah, peace in the Middle East achieved. Wait, is Anatolia even in the Middle East? Whatever, I hear anime girls calling from all the way over there. I wonder what they mean when they ask me to torch Kyoto. Alright, we finally arrived in Japan. Now what the fuck am I supposed to do here? So sneak our way to Kurikara. Should be easy enough. But the Tyra guards would never let us pass without a good old samurai fight. And since this is Japan, there's no surrender, and we wiped their division clean. With the way clear, the care package arrives safe and sound in the city, followed by our brave samurais. No problems, Mr. Yamaha. And Mitsubishi will be arriving soon. Because the shipment of rice whiskey and hentai boosted morale to new levels, the city becomes ours. First step is making sure the rice fields are working at full capacity, and we are on the way to Imperial Age. Because Imperial Japan is famous for its shenanigans with who disagrees with them. Like what they did in Korea, or the horrifying Unit 741 where, oh my god, I hate when the game does this shit with pulling the camera. I don't care about any of this now. You have to make sushis with the shallow water fish for now. Anyways, we have to kill 5 commanders, and as you can see, the reception is as warm as an ice bath. The first camp is weird and densely packed with pointless buildings, so we suffer heavy casualties cleaning up the area. But the first commander falls. Little break now to start a farm on top of bricks, and we send another contingent of samurais to clear the way towards the second camp. Mr. Hojo Toyota, of course I'll send you some traps, any help against the oppressors is welcome. Out of spite for the damage they did, I finish raising the first camp, and we march towards the second closest to us, and no, son of a bitch, dick monger, totem pole liquor. I don't care about any of this, my people have their own sushi production, we don't need your care package. 
Our small army sneaks in the city and the Hojo becomes a friend. Kyoto will never have a chance against us. But it's not like it'll be without a fight, so we throw in the oven some upgrades and as many samurais as we can. Meanwhile, we continue to push into the enemy lines and begin the final face-off of the second commander. Two down, three to go. Our scouts report that there is another commander just down south of where we are. But as we approach it, news from Hojo arrives that he took matters into his own hands and killed the third commander. Fantastic, one less thing to worry about. But now, where do we find the final two commanders? Excuse me everybody, have you seen a commander anywhere around here? I'm thinking he looks Japanese and, uh, speaks Japanese? Possibly wearing armor? The peasants were no help, but we end up finding another commander just standing on a map clearing. The fight was simple and because my mood improved, we marched north to see what we can do for the lighthouse our buddy told us about earlier in the game. And as it seems, luck is turning in our favor because the final commander was hiding there. Sadly, I don't read and didn't notice that it would have been more efficient to do both objectives at once and I'm forced to de fully destroy the entire army before going into Kyoto. At least we never stopped the production and our army looks stronger than ever. And because I still haven't read the objective, we start blasting Kyoto with the entire army still standing. Although we can also call it styling over the army. You know, just walking in like we own the chunky lemon milk, while their army still stands. But no, I actually thought I could just walk into the city and capture the monument. In my defense, I have played the scenario recently in co-op, and my ally did the Tyra cleansing for me, so it didn't register in my head that they had to be gone. But some kind souls pointed out in the chat, and we sent a division of samurais to clear out Tyra. Inside, we continue causing chaos and leveling the city out of boredom, waiting for Tyra to finally resign so we can finish this log fest. After some time raising castles and buildings inside and out of Kyoto, the Tyra army finally resigns, and we get another rage-inducing camera drag towards Lord Mitsubishi arriving in the scene. Alright buddy, can you rush down to Kyoto then and show that might for us? To not waste time, we rush the monument and perform a forceful Sudoku on the final Tyra warlord. Sadly, that's still not enough, and we must continue leveling the city in order to take it, because apparently the Japanese population doesn't surrender until every single person is dead. Even if they're inside the city, we must hunt them down and make our presence everywhere noted for the resignation. About fucking time. And speaking of time, we get a very meh 1 hour 8 minutes and 35 seconds. Tada Hakai Shinakata Dake de- Oh god, one hour in Japan and I started speaking hentai. I need to cleanse myself, maybe crusading will lift my mood. And what better way to start our crusading with crashing all our ships because of a storm and making it the civilian population's problem. And since they kidnapped my sister, we have an awesome Kazu's belly. I mean, who brings their sister to a crusade? I know it might be on purpose so they had a reason to do what they want, but still, it just seems careless with your own family to do that. I, for example, would never bring my sister, not with those arms weak like wet noodles. Anyways, the whole might of Richard the Lionheart disembarks in Cyprus, and set a fictional invisible camp while the navy scouts around for more shipwrecked English troops we can use. With the straggler secured, we go back to the beach and start organizing the troops to start dealing with the dickheads in Nicosia. The army we start with is beyond solid, composed of longbowmen, cavaliers and siege weapons, so we don't waste time, ignore the secondary objectives and go straight for massacring the people just trying to live their lives there. Yeah buddy, you shouldn't have kidnapped my sister. We arrive in the vicinity of the city and start preparing the siege. We don't need a base, Mr. Pikeman, we got this. The cavalry runs ahead scouting what's on our way towards Jacqueline, or whatever the sister is called. We'll call her Jacqueline. Because Nicosia is built so weirdly, positioning the army is very awkward, and the siege takes longer than expected from the get-go. It doesn't help that the trap just targets whatever it wants, but we slowly push through their lines of defense. And with their walls dealt with, the rams lead the way to the first castle inside the citadel, with the longbowmen right behind providing long-range support. Britannia may not have ruled these waves, but it will rule the island with an iron fist. I mean, they could just give me Jacqueline back and surrender, but we just know they'll make it our problem until the bitter end. Because castles and walls aren't enough, they're also defended by the classic ICBM tower, so caution is paramount when dealing with that. At this point we have lost about half the army due to sheer incompetence, but that doesn't hinder the push even in the slightest, and brick by brick we dismantle the sexist dictatorship of Nicosia. But how do we even know they're sexist? Well, history is told by the winners, so I'm choosing whatever narrative I want for this. In a depressing twist of events, Nicosia scraps together an onager and makes pate of our longbowmen in two volleys. Also the king died of dysentery while fighting the archery range. With just five archers and two horsemen standing to protect the trebuchet, faith seems to be fading faster than our arrival in the island. But Richard will not allow adversity to get in the way of rescuing his sister and the leveling continued with as much gusto as it has been since the beginning. 
The problems continue with just a night left when the Navy finds more troops stranded on a beach. The news which left Nicosia trembling in their legs, forcing their unconditional surrender to the crown. Yep, clap Isaac's cheek so he learns not to mess with England. Cyprus will not see the sunset for a long time after this, and we did it in 33 minutes and 1 second. Jesus, that was a rough ending. I thought Longbowman would be enough. Time to learn some new tricks, because they're catching up to me, and I've heard the Turks have been playing with some fun new toys. And we're back again in Turkey to pester the Byzantines. This time, 200 years later, and with more guidance from the one we're supposed to protect, the Sultan of Rum. We start traveling light, just us and some troops. The way is dangerous and full of angry enemies, but we blaze through it and arrive at Osman Estate to start a malignous plot to take over the region. Because everyone around is sick and tired of the Byzantines, we are offered help from everywhere in our journey, making our time here much more balanced and safe. But it's not just random lost soldiers that want the fake Romans gone. We can also ally with one of the Turkish cities in the region, Karezi, Jermian or Kandar. But we'll ignore that for now as we have time to choose and choosing quick means the others attack earlier. The focus in the beginning is expanding the camp and preparing the mass production of gunpowder we'll need to fight the oppressors. Because of their strategic position in the map, we choose Jermian as our ally, so we can hide behind them if things go south. They also give us a buttload of technologies, but that's just secondary. We place a town center much behind their walls as choosing them means the other two cities think we suck from now on. But that's just for extra safety, as we have castles coming along and the mighty Janissary is being trained. We also add another castle here, just to be sure. Also more siege workshops, for we are Turks and have bombard cannons. We just have to be careful with the cannons getting trigger happy, because they don't just hurt the enemy. Reinforcements come often from the faraway lands, but they are not gunpowder units, so it's forgettable at best. With a decent number of pointy hat riflemen, we march to Kandar to give them a spanking for not supporting us unconditionally. They try their best to mitigate the power of the Turkish gunpowder, but it's futile and we push into their city. Pew pew, die trash! The cannonballs start flying and in less than a minute, Kandar falls to our hands. Hmm, it's actually a pretty big city to put our hands on. Anyways, let's get more Janissaries. This time supported by the massive cavalry we gain for free, the push towards the Byzantines begin. And just by using them a bit here, I want to make the Turks my main civilization. Gunpowder is so much fun when everyone else is running at you with swords and bows. Pathetic. Die trash. The cannons crawl closer to the enemy city and without even having to deal with the walls, the castle starts feeling the rain of lead. But what's that? Karez is sending siege rams. The one thing I can't defend myself from. Run, bombards. Don't let the rams reach you. Dude, your name means flower. You're not scaring anyone. Luckily, the cavalry arrive on time and the cannons are safe. Excuse me, lady, you're not allowed to talk around here. On the way towards the northern castle, we are facing against Mr. Flower, and despite being caught by surprise, we move on with minimal damage to the army. I don't know why I disintegrated the deer, but it's worth showing it here. Everyone opposing us gets led, wildlife and civilians included. Oh no, the Byzantines fortified themselves with napalm. Better nuke civilians from orbit. Pew pew, make way for the Janissaries. With the way towards the castle open, the cannons start doing their job, and while I'm not paying attention, the final castle falls, solidifying the Turks as the main force in Anatolia. Scenario over, in 56 minutes and 2 seconds. God damn, I love gunpowder. But like everything that's sweet, it must come to an end, and we travel to the land of West Taiwan, long before we need the Pooh Douglas claws in, to fight in the water. This is gonna suck so much. But how bad can it be, really? Right? Well, first we must clear the way off danger so a suicidal transport ship can reach the city of Nanchang. And then we must defend the city while five more transport ships come from every corner of the map. You know, from behind enemy lines. And then we must build a wander, so you tell me. We start from the west side with the crappy navy and some dickhead petard already rushing us. Because I don't know if I've mentioned, but everything here is timed. But we clearly don't have time to bitch about it, so while the navy pushes into the fjord, a small village joins us and gifts us the trebuchet they had rusting in a garage. Their kindness is much appreciated and we advance by land to clear the area from Huns. Wait, I can't really call it Huns, right? A flock of Hun? A murder of Hun. Yeah, that works. Anyways, because just fighting a superior navy is not enough, the way is also polluted with guard towers, making the trap bequeathed to us the most convenient thing since the invention of the air fryer. Especially considering the Chinese in this reality are advancing really weird in the tech tree and have napalm. As payback for the treb, we build the village a town center. Being not entirely sure if I would clear the area in time, a blockade is ordered, which I was also not entirely sure if it would work. But preliminary tests show the high probability of success. 
With the town center built, more villagers flocked to what was now called the city of Tiananmen Square. And because the city was thriving so much, we built also a dock on the northern part of it. The Hun was not appreciative of our new town, so we had to sink more of their ships. As time passed, the settlement prospered, with its own navy being formed. And with it closing in, the armada set sails to clear the remaining of the way. As even though the blockade seemed to work, we would still have to make sure the shipment arrives in Nanchang. Moment of truth. Transport ship arrives in the entrance of the lake and phases through the blockade, because apparently hitboxes don't exist in China. Panic sets in and the entire navy gets put in a scort formation, because if the transport ship sinks, we lose. As we hit open waters, the Hun navy shows up with anger in their hearts and a lucky boner for attacking us and not the transport ship. Not that it matters, because their navy is so big and omnipresent, the US would blush seeing this. So, apparently ships blocking the way doesn't work with allied ships, only our own. Now we learned a lesson, so we can go again. But what about blocking it with buildings? The docks should be able to completely close off the passage, we just have to make sure every corner of it is covered. It seems to be completely closed off, but our eyes have deceived us before, and just to be sure, we go ahead and start clearing the way of the murder of Han with a lot more time on the clock. But the lake is much more dangerous than previously expected, with China showing more and more secret weapons as we explore. However, in open waters, our dominance is easily shown, and we reach the city of Nanchang on the other side of Lake Poyang, just in time for the transport ship to appear out west. So you're telling me I had to found a new city, build a navy and fight hundreds of enemy ships for lumber? Well, at least the Great Dock Wall of China worked, and even though the way is cleared from immediate danger, we expand the cleared area and torch some Hun soldiers alive before letting the transport ship pass through the blockade. Even though the area was safe, I was still sweating my ass off until the moment the transport ship unloaded every 2x4 safely. But that was just the beginning in our lake journey. The whole city of Nanchang became ours, and the force camera movement points at where the next shipment will arrive from. Me, 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 we can't afford to make mistakes. I like how they say it as if I owed them anything. They should be thanking me. I have so far built a beautiful new city and cleared the lake from the Hun Pest, which I continue doing. On our way towards the next rendezvous point, we meet Chinese pirates who offer loyalty to us for 2000 gold. It's a hefty amount of gold, but I think it's probably a good idea to pay them off. Fortunately, Neng Cheng had a big pile just hanging around next to the town center, and we pay off the pirates, and they pledge the destruction of the Han navy. With about 5 minutes left until the shipment arrived, we continue pushing deeper into the lake to clear the way. And I gotta say just one thing, I've never seen the sea so populated in a scenario before. There are enemy ships and towers literally everywhere. But the way was clear, and the towers is destroyed before the shipment of statues and ornaments arrive. The navy escorts the transport ship unbothered, and now Neng Cheng receives the second shipment. Immediately after we are notified of the next arrival, not where half the navy was sunk by a kamikaze, here, in the far north of the map. Oh no, the Chinese army sending tanks to Tiananmen Square! The navy starts making way and... Oh Jesus Christ! Oh my god! Why? 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 <laughs> Every single ship was lost. We have a minor setback, but the push continues and the way is clear for the third shipment. In fear of the Hun army coming by land, the city is reinforced with the castle and the navy tirelessly pushes further and further into Hun territory. The ship arrives and despite taking some of the spine-chilling shots to its hull, it survives and arrives with ease at the Nangcheng port. Because nothing really happened since, we fast forward to the arrival of the fourth ship, coming from the east. The planned route showed the ship sailing right in front of Admiral Chen's eastern base and an encampment riddled with bombards and ICBM towers. So the entire navy is sacrificed to protect the shipment, that arrives safely in the city. Only one shipment remained, and obviously it arrives from the only corner of the map we haven't explored throughout the game, which meant was still heavily guarded by another murder of Han dickheads, so we scrambled to assemble another navy in time. The whole process was taking longer than expected, but while we explore the north, a group of shipbuilders appear and offer to build us the finest ships in the region for 100 gold. Mmm, yes please, I'll take 20. While we wait for a new fleet to be delivered, Admiral Chen launches a full-scale attack in Nancheng, catching us by surprise just outside city walls and leaving the navy stuck between two enemies. However, at this point it was past the point of no return and we sank both enemies and continue pushing towards the last rendezvous point. Up north it was time to test our new fleet, and I really hope they make the dragon ship into a unique unit when they split China, because not only look cool, they're very strong as well. The final shipment appears, and it's rushed back to the city, so we can finally start building this damn wonder. Are you sure, Mr. Petard? Don't we still need some albino camel turds to use as garden fertilizer? Why am I giving them ideas? 
The name of the game becomes Defense at All Costs, and we order more of those fine dragon ships from the shipbuilders. Not only is good cost benefit, it's also delivered instantly. They get a 5 star review on Trustpilot. Oh what, the construction of the temple has custom stages. There's no other wonder in where this happens, right? While the navy kicks ass at sea, Admiral Chen sends an amphibious assault. But because I'm the most underrated genius of our time, I unintentionally walled the shore and his army was stuck. Another castle is ordered as a safety measure, and the cavalry is sent to clean up the assault. The Chinese army marches on Tiananmen Square. Never forget what happened here. What the hell, this looks so cool. But I wonder why just the Chinese get this type of treatment with the wonder. Hmm, interesting. I see. The temple is finally complete, and at least we don't have to wait 200 years. The Hun just give up. And thank god they did, because this took us an hour 43 minutes and 28 seconds to complete. Without counting the first half hour wasted. This was awful, and whoever designed this deserves to step in a Lego. I need something to balance things out. Maybe invading France a bit would work. Yeah, let's take on Henry V. Nothing like plowing through the French countryside to cleanse the palate after the shit show that was China. Even if it means us retreating back home, we can still do some serious damage. And I think we can even be more efficient than expected here and just evacuate the king. Maybe bring the horseman with, just so we can camouflage the French in him. Historically we would have to stay and fight against heaps of French knights and royalty. They even mention it here. But why waste time with that, when we can just trample them with ease and continue on our journey to the strait? The story of the battle is quite cool, with the English making Swiss cheese out of the French army, but beating them at their own game of surrendering is just as fun. King safe and sound on the ship, and safely disembarking on the southern coast of England. Possibly the fastest time I've ever had in a scenario, in 3 minutes and 48 seconds. Fuck, not only was way too quick, I tripped getting off the boat and got a lift. I guess I have This is annoying, I can't do this. By the way, why are we Spanish here if most of the Holy League was Italian? But I'm not here to shit on Spain's inability to pronounce words. We are here to build a wonder and kick Ottoman ass. And both mean the same, apparently. The objective here is simple, building the wonder as a fuck you symbol against the Turks and defending against the endless waves of amphibious assaults. Exactly. Why did our brilliant leaders decide to build this shit on the coast? Especially considering how strong and gunpowdery the Ottoman navy is. Look at this. It's the first wave and they're already blowing us to oblivion. Guess we'll have to beat them at their own game. But it's still scary to see this many cannon galleons slowly coming our way. Oh god, and they're going straight for the wonder. I think I'll need a bigger navy for this. We managed to repel the first attack, and morale seems to not have been hit that hard. But it's important we stay on our toes because they're not slowing down. Let's attack the butt sex folk down south just so we show we'll not take backstabbings lightly. Oh wow, that worked. Even if they're asking for 800 gold for a piece. Yeah, I'll pay the price to have them off my back. This is the quickest allegiance switch I've ever seen in this game. Wonder finished in a surprisingly good 14 minutes, now we just have to make sure the siesta monument survives 200 years. I don't get why we're Spanish here though. Spain was a part of the Holy League, but even though they sent 49 galleys to the battle, Venice for example sent over 100. Oh god, I lose focus for a minute and there's goddamn camels crawling everywhere in the base. Oh no, they're following me inside, I think I'm doomed. Please don't follow me all the way here and ha! Get baited, scumbag. I should probably defend this area better because this is starting to look like Florida in the 80s. At least the AI is beyond stupid and uses the petards on random walls. Yeah, get sank. And it seems like we're a bit more stable. But I'll build more bombard towers just in case some pesky ships breaks the blockade. Although I find it hard to believe anyone would be able to pass here. Ah yes, do pay me back the money I just paid you to stop fighting me. Not only that, they make you pay 800 gold so they can pay you back and allow you to mine their gigantic gold mines. No wonder Greece has an economy as stable as a bowl of thermite. Look at this, instead of building towers around it for nothing, they could be, you know, mining this. Whatever, AOE logic not always makes sense, and we still have a very angry Ottoman navy attacking us. Although I don't think they can break the blockade in time, there's less than 20 years left. Die a napalm death, heretic. And very anticlimatically, the scenario ends in 31 minutes and 24 seconds. While we sank the kebab navy, I started hearing more hentai off the distance, asking for help as Japan is apparently on fire with the civil war. Just what we need, but we might have arrived a bit too late to save the city. No, not his honor, it has to be saved. It's a very cinematic introduction, even though it does the annoying camera pull out of the action. But it makes sense, speed is essential here to recapture Kyoto from the evil anime forces. The troops disembark and I gotta say, it's a pretty disappointing force we have. Thankfully they also have some petards to breach the walls, and we can sneak into the city. Excuse me unsuspecting citizens, you are being liberated in the name of Lord Nobunaga. 
Thank God we captured the Bombards this easily. Feels like if it was a different campaign designer, we would have had to solve the Hellraiser puzzle to get a hold of these. Or even worse, convert them. We enter the inner city and everyone commits Sudoku, which, yeah, it fits the Japanese style, but it's not like I would have done any harm to the villagers if they surrendered. This is a bit of a pain in the ass since we'll have to reproduce these 15 guys we have until we have enough villagers, but at least we can bomb Osaka while the villagers are on the way. And we can be inefficient with the villagers. Look at these two sheep dead. Because we don't actually conquer the whole city, we need to also move to the other districts to liberate it, and we came prepared with the monk for that pesky hidden mangano. Just a second here to kill a third unsuspecting sheep, and we go back to the planned preparations with the dock from where we came from, while the army worked towards complete liberation of Osaka, getting rid of these men-at-arms and the samurai still stuck on the hill where the castle was. With the city liberated, we can focus on expanding the army, as Kyoto is heavily guarded and we will need all the hand cannoneers and samurais we can muster. Wait, what? They changed the icon for the keep? Why would they do that? This one looks so out of perspective. The sea way towards Kyoto is long and filled with enemy ships, so while the army is being trade, we lose both ships we had to the enemy navy. A worrying sight for sure, but something we should be able to handle with our own floaty boys. Look at this, Kyoto doesn't stand a chance against our napalm. Time to get everyone in the ships and make way towards the objective. Our navy is struggling a bit with the game of cat and mouse, but Kyoto has collected all the relics, so fucking around is not an option anymore. Troops disembark right before Kyoto caught us with our pants down in the water, and we start plowing at their defenses since there is no turning back anymore. Fucking nailed it. Wall breached after the slight ram hiccup, and the way is cleared off these awful to fight against towers. Just to change that luck of ours a bit, the monastery holding all relics is right here, and then it isn't anymore. Sadly, the forest monks chant the sushi rhymes from the pine tree, and we lose one cannon. We must haste, because I don't like the looks of these sneaky conversions. The city is annoyingly packed with towers, so the push is hindered by the time it takes to topple them. Luckily they only train infantry, so pushing further is not that big of a deal when you bring a firing squad, and very quickly two castles fall to Nobunaga's a bit delayed but still with good intentions recovery crew. Little two minute break to destroy houses of worship, and we are back to shooting civilians just leaving their lives because I lost focus for a minute. Nuh uh uh, no hiding in the tower young lady. The final castle is within reach, and the name of the game becomes defending the cannons from the fire ships. Thankfully they're made of paper, and the final castle falls very easily. I don't know buddy, forceful takeovers don't transpire that much stability. And Kyoto is Japanese again, or something like that. 43 minutes and 35 seconds. What? I helped you guys and you kicked me out like this? Fine, I guess I'll help the Koreans now then. And they straight away come after my new friends and I. But Korea must be defended at all costs, and we start the defense with a magnificent defensive castle. There's an achievement for defending the Wander here successfully, but considering this is a naval map, I'll consider it something beyond secondary. We manage to push the Japanese forces away and start working to reinforce the defenses around the Wander. Knowing the strength of Korea, we train war wagons and turtle- nope, we can't have the turtle ships yet. Admiral is still sleeping, and we must find him. Apparently he's been working this for so long, a fucking forest grew around the walls. Onagers are ordered to deal with it when the Japanese launch an amphibious assault. Luckily Korean towers are a scary affair and we can focus on destroying the environment. With the forest cleared and the Japanese army turned to Swiss cheese, our scout rushes in to find Admiral Yi holding one of the most beautiful pieces of military technology ever created, the turtle ship. On our way back, we also meet some friendly Chinese troops stuck in a random island who offer to help us with big artillery pieces. The turtle ships start rolling in when the Japanese forces appear by land the second time, with their rams terrorizing our completely ranged army. They also come by sea, but at this point our navy is vastly superior, and we start pushing onto their docks. The turtle ships aren't the best at dealing with buildings, so strength in numbers is necessary. Oh yeah, I forgot about the Chinese troops. Oopsie daisy, haha. <laughs> yeah, losing a ship sucks, but the destruction animation is so cool. The push continues at full speed, with the second fleet arriving to clear the northern part of the island, and slowly but surely, the Japanese docks start sinking to the bottom of the ocean. When I was a kid, for some reason this scenario terrified me. There was a mystic behind having to find Admiral Yi, and all the Japanese forces coming from everywhere was super scary. With 6 out of 7 docks destroyed, the only thing missing was diving right under their defenses for the last one. We gathered all turtles we could build, and rolled into the bay causing all the pain and discomfort we could under coastal population, and as the final dock fell, Korea is free again. A nuke-free defeat on the Japanese, in 39 minutes and 35 seconds. Total runtime, 15 hours, 25 minutes and 16 seconds. Phew, 
This was a lot of work, Jesus Christ. I don't know if the historical battles can be considered a campaign, but if it could, it would range from one of the best to one of the worst within these 16 scenarios. And the final time for all the campaigns ends at 185 hours, 9 minutes and 8 seconds. Almost 8 days of constant playing. 183 if you disconsider Trajan as it is a Age of Empires 1 campaign, but that is still a ridiculous amount of time. Now this video has already been a marathon of epic proportions, to edit and I imagine to watch it as well, so I won't drag it any further. There will be a follow-up soon as a summary of this 9 month journey, for some stats and extra jokes and what's coming in the future, so let me know if you guys have any questions or whatever you want to see explained or revealed.